there's one thing I want to address before we do this capsule, right? Um, I don't have cancer. I'm dieting at the moment for a photo shoot. <laughs> Right. That having been said, uh, I'm here with my good friend Alex Babin, who uh, often gives seminars with me. He's my, uh, my friend specialist in powerlifting training. And one subject I'd like him to address, and then we will discuss it further, is the use of minimalist high frequency training in powerlifting. As some of you might know, uh, one of the approaches that's quite popular in strength sport, and it originates from Olympic weightlifting, especially the Bulgarian type of training, is to rely on very few exercises, mostly only the competition exercises uh, in Olympic weightlifting would be the snatch, the clean and jerk, and also the squat. In powerlifting, of course, deadlift, bench press, squat. And that theory is that you train mostly on the competition lift, very high number of times during the week, three to five times during the week, uh, and you basically become super efficient in those movements, which increases your strength. Right. So mm -hmm. what have you found regarding the positive and negative of minimalist training? I think when we talk about um, training for strength, there are three, three variables that are very important that we should know uh, in regards to, to uh, programming the training. There's volume, training volume. Mm -hmm. How long are you training for? Um, how much work are you getting into your training sessions? Then there's, there's intensity. How heavy is the load that you're lifting? Um, what, what percentages that you're, that you're lifting um, and then there's also high freq frequency that you can mm -hmm. play with so how often are you doing those lifts um, I think the key component to having an efficient programming is to be able to manage those three variables in order to get to the goals that you're looking for so uh, I think the the important thing is you can't have all three of those elevated on a training program mm -hmm. if your frequency is high and your intensity is high, then your volume has to drop. Mm -hmm. If your volume is high and your, tr and your intensity is high, then obviously your frequency has to drop and vice versa. So um, in my case, I train a lot of beginners and intermediate, uh, intermediate trainees. And I have found that the best way to get them to gain strength and muscle um, is to play with high frequency. So keeping the intensity somewhat high elevated, but, but getting them to do the lifts pretty often. You know, there's two things that, um, that get you to lift heavy weights, that get you stronger. So first, we know that muscle moves weight. So if you don't have muscle, your uh, potentiation for, for strength gains is very low. So the more muscle that you have, the more able or uh, capable you are to eventually get stronger. And the second is uh, getting your, your central nervous system used to, get to lifting that load, mm. um, getting that proper technique, becoming efficient, like you said, in, in doing that, uh, that such lift. When we, come, when we talk about muscle mass and getting that, that muscle, the hypertrophy training, high frequency, if, if we're talking about uh, natural athletes, not athletes that are taking performance enhancement drugs, steroids, the best way to get them to gain muscle, and you've actually talked about this yep. in one of your capsules recently, is to train that muscle frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, for many reasons, we talk about mTOR, the, 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 the light well, switch. The actual the training session itself is the trigger for protein synthesis. So if you don't have that trigger, that, that, then you can't grow muscle. Now, of course, an enhanced athlete will have that increase in anabolic rate by using products. So he doesn't need the actual yeah. training session. So that, that's one of the reasons uh -huh. why uh -huh. high frequency is important for muscle. And cortisol. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. But then again, if you train often and you have also a high volume at each session, then that cortisol might actually become a problem. That's why if you train frequently, you have to drop the volume. Yeah, yeah. And also one thing that personally, I, I, I'm, I'm not against, of course, high frequency training. The best gains I made in strength on a specific lift was when I was training that lift four or five times a week. Like my, I took my high pole, from 120 to 180 kilos mm -hmm. and in four weeks just by focusing exclusively on that. Same thing with my bench press. But one thing that I would worry about would be like the beginners, because I agree that beginners are those who would benefit the most from high frequency because they need to practice that. You're movement. learning that motor pattern. Exactly. It's new to them. But, but if they don't have proper coaching though, because it, it, practice doesn't make perfect, practice m makes permanent. So if they are practicing bad motor patterns, then they might actually make things much worse in the future. So that might be something you need to consider. Yeah. And the need for a good coaching. Absolutely. But that goes without saying, I mean, because whether, whether it's high frequency or high volume or high intensity, if you do it with bad form, mm -hmm. then that's what you'll learn. Um, 
So provided you have good form and you have good coaching, um, the, the best way to learn a motor pattern is to practice yeah. it often and, uh, and, and regularly. So I think high frequency for, for strength gains for beginners mm -hmm. and intermediate trainees uh, is, is the best way I found to, uh, to, to get strength gains. And at what, which point would you think it becomes necessary to move away from that high frequency and go more with toward the intensity or mm -hmm. using more assistance work to build up lagging muscle group like what when you become of course more advanced but is there a, a certain point that you've noticed uh, if an advanced athlete keep keep pushing with that high frequency does he risk creating injuries overuse injuries mm -hmm. do you find that it, it might happen more often with the advanced athletes? yeah that's actually that's actually a good point if you look at all top the top dogs in powerlifting right now in pretty much every weight class in the world you'll see that most of their training is not so much frequent, but there isn't much accessory work. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we're talking about the top dogs in the powerlifting world right now, they don't need that much accessory. Think about accessory work, the thing, and var uh, variation exercises, they should be used in your training template to develop whatever weakness that you have in your game. But if we're talking about the top dogs in powerlifting or whatever other sport, their weaknesses are so little, mm. they don't need that much accessory or variation is it, work. Is it because they are built for that sport? Ah. Or is it because the, the, the years of training actually build the right muscle? Because it, it could be argued that if I'm lifting with perfect technique, let's say for example, I'm, I'm a bench pressing. Mm -hmm. People think of the bench press as a tricep, deltoid, and pectoral exercise as well. If you know how to bench press, the lats, rear delts, upper back will work just as hard as the other muscle groups. Sure. You can actually build those muscle by bench pressing properly. Mm -hmm. so, so if someone has been training properly for years, mm -hmm. then the argument might be that they might actually be pretty balanced. Yeah. I think that those who will have those, those issues might be those with like very poor leverages mm -hmm. or who never learn perfect technique. And I know from experience that you can actually be pretty strong by building some muscle at a very high level, even if you don't have perfect technique, but then you're gonna have problems down the road. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that's something I might consider. And I think it's important, like just to go back a little bit, because you were talking about accessory variation and frequency, I actually use variation exercises and accessory work mm -hmm. in my high frequency training templates. How do you do that? I'll lower the volume for the main lifts. Mm -hmm. depending, so depending on what your weaknesses are, depending on your level of athleticism or strength, um, so if you really are a beginner, you'll definitely have major weaknesses in your game. Mm -hmm. um, but, and, and this is a mistake that, we, that I see very often. A lot of guys, girls too, they pick up the bar and they say, they see cool exercises online. Oh, I want to do safety squat bars. I want to use bars, uh, bands. I want to use chains. And they end up prioritizing those variation exercises and accessory work instead of prioritizing their main lift. If you want to get good at squatting, you're not going to get good at squatting by doing lat pull downs. Yeah. You're gonna get good at squatting by squatting. So you have to do that main work. But for somebody that, ha that doesn't have that much experience in lifting, I will have them do high frequency training and add variation exercise and accessory work to uh, develop their, their weaknesses. That's a cool topic and uh, we're gonna talk about that in the next capsule because it deserves a capsule on its own about the, the role of assistance work. But I so agree. far, I think that it's, it's pretty cool. That, you know, it's a tool. High frequency, we both agree that if you want to become technically efficient, neurologically efficient, yeah high frequency is the way to go as far as building strength. Oh yeah. Of course. And of course we're talking mostly about a strength sport. Yeah. Because getting strong for hockey or a CrossFit, you might need to practice more different patterns. But if it is all about becoming as strong as possible in a few lifts, of course, I, I do believe the high frequency is, is key for most people. And I think you mentioned yeah. that it's best for beginners and intermediate. Mm -hmm. But really, how many people truly are advanced? I mean, you bench press 440. Do you consider yourself a very advanced powerlifter? At all. No, exactly. Not at all. Uh, so, so people who are like, oh man, I, I bench press 365. I, I'm, I'm ready for like chains, bands, and like the most yeah. advanced space age program. No, you're not. You're not advanced <laughs> yet, right? Yeah. I and there's nothing wrong in saying you're not advanced yet, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. So it's just a matter of like being able to know exactly where you are and selecting the best method for you. I agree. I agree.